in there for it now. This is Patrick Smith. He's a keen angler and he uses maggots as bait. And this is Patrick Smith. He's an artist. When I was training, when I was at Leeds, I read a book by James Gleek on chaos theory. It's one of the best things I've ever read. It got me thinking about looseness and randomness. I was out fishing and I was, you know, I wasn't catching many fish really. And I took the top off the pit box and I just, it, there it was. And it's one of those lateral things really. I just thought, that's it. It was like, you're, like a cry of Eureka. I thought, I wonder if it'll work. What the maggots are doing is they're pressing into this waxy substance on the plate. Anything immersed into that leaves an impression. The plate goes into a map and Castle and bites the plate. The phone did not stop ringing. Yeah. For a week it was national. It was mad. They wanted me on the big breakfast with the Dees Van Alton and Johnny Vaughan and, but they were going to have somebody in a maggot suit and they were going to this and they were going to do that. Why did you get off the merry-go-round? Whilst I didn't mind having a bit of a lampoon and I didn't mind a bit of fun, um, because that's, you know, obviously that, that was something really for the public to engage with. At the point, I am a serious artist underneath it, and I, I could see that it was going down a certain trajectory, which was not what I'm about. And, um, and one thing I've got is uh, a sense of dignity and pride and belief in my work. So in that way, I, I, stopped, um, I stopped it in its tracks. I was doing it purely and simply to break out of this um, very autocratic prescribed engineering pass and it certainly did the trick it, it 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 got me where i needed to be and i've i've never looked back really i've always been a lot freer with my ideas i think having the background i've got with all this is fantastic and machinery doesn't scare me i'm, I'm not phased by process or technique but i'm ever seeking ways of freeing up from technique because technique can be the death knell it can be a a real killer if you you know, if you if you let it take over, you mustn't. Uh, you really mustn't get too uh, too absorbed by it. We can. I tell you what, we'll get a we'll get a pencil. Um, pencil. Pencil. So we're going to do a. I don't know. I mean, one of one of the artists I really like was a nineteen forties modernist, Ben Nicholson, and he he sort of had these sort of lovely sort of shapes going in his work you know all sorts of ideas and you've got to think he's coming out of modernism he, he's heavily influenced by cubism um the st ives movement there's also so it's very free simple drawing some of that drawing will disappear but it doesn't really matter we're only playing we can also test stencils we can you know i mean this is totally unorthodox but it's this is an old stencil these are old acetates that i've got and these have already got ink on them so, and we can even, what we can do, just to, just to be a bit more, we can pick in cup lot, put a bit of blue on. So put a bit of blue on there. And that'll be quite interesting because we're going to take a print, but then we're going to work with the ghost. So let's put that on the press. Now, what I've got here is my etching press. It's a direct drive. It's not geared ratio, this one. My other press is a roller core, big one. And that's a, a, an Atelier in Moulton. Uh, Henny's got that one. Henny's a very dear friend of mine. She's a very well-established and very talented textile designer. So we're going to work together. I mean, we've done some collaborative prints, which might interest you. Uh, this is what you can do when you get going, which is amazing. Now, that's Henny's design thing going through there, and then all the rest of it's mine with the stencils and, and plain. So there's... A real orthodoxy there, playing around with a, a, a quite a linear composition going through, also breaking the edge. That's very important. So this will end up in a double mount and behind glass eventually. So what we're going to do now is we're going to print this. Now in order to print this, I've got to sensitise the paper. We take the paper. Now this is just ordinary cartridge. Uh, when I say ordinary cartridge, it's good quality. It's 220 GSM acid free pH neutral paper so you know for this game it's bulletproof and you notice yes I'm getting a few marks on with my fingers but I tend to be I know I've got an area that's going to be protected by the mount so it doesn't really matter if you were a purist you'd pick it up with what we call paper fingers but one thing I'm not is a purist 
Now what I'm actually doing here is I'm taking off the residual moisture. I used to use blotting paper but it can get quite expensive so and you can see it actually trickling back into the tray. But what it's actually doing is it's annealing the surface of the paper. It's actually taking the, the sort of uh, fibres, sucking that water up and creating, a, if you like, a, a very smooth uh, matrices, if you like, or whatever, for the ink to suck to. Because the ink, once it goes through the etching press, the ink will absolutely adhere and it'll pick every mark up. The trick, of course, is the pressure. You can overdo the pressure and lose and lose the definition. I line them up and I drop it. What I don't do is mess about with it because if you try and mess about with it, you'll you'll just completely ruin it. We put this on. And the reason we put newsprint on or newspaper, whatever you've got your hands on. I mean, I've run out of newsprint, so I'm using this at the moment. We do that to protect the blankets. These are swanskin blankets. The paper has got size in it and the size can rot the blankets with extensive use so obviously I've had these blankets on this press for 20 years so they're doing well <laughs> they get well used so now I already know the pressure of this but I can sort of just feel it it's all done by feel and and then it goes through the press now the, the trick here is to keep it flowing what you can't do is stop. If you stop, you get a line in the thing because this is going under massive tonnage between those rollers. The idea of the press is, and you don't need an etching press to make monoprints. You can do it with a baron. You know, you do it with a wooden spoon. But you can get far more work done, far more productively with one of these. They're various sizes, these presses, and um, they're absolutely fantastic. I mean, they come into their own when you're doing uh, intaglio processes, as I described earlier on. Uh, then you really do need a press. You can't, you can't really do it without. Um, William Hater pioneered a technique though in the 1940s whereby you could actually take an intaglio uh, by using plaster, which is a clever idea if you haven't got a press. And I think he did some of them when he was in Paris. So that's the big reveal, and that's just the start. I mean, that's rather, rather interesting, rather nice. You've got some nice orthodoxies going on because you've got the what you've got there quite graphically is you've got the stencil doing the work um, but you've also got this lovely random nature and if you remember we picked a bit of that blue up and it's also got some black on there as well but uh, you know that is a start it's not it, it, you know by any means is it any good I mean what we're going to do now this is where this is where printmaking takes off this is where I start getting excited because if we look here now We've got here, under here, we've got that absolutely gorgeous sexy beast there. Look. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to offset that look. And what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to pull that off there if I can get it off, that's it. And I'm also going to put that there. And what's absolutely lovely with this, is you've now got, this is going to be the print. This is going to be the print. This is the ghost. I'm printing the ghost. I could, if I wanted to, make marks within that while it's on the stencil. So, in other words, if I wanted to, I could hold that. I could do this Etruscan thing going on. And this was based on a piece of work I did for a gallery in Scarborough. And it was um, Tangle Threads. And what it was, it was we were looking at... Ordnance Survey maps and and uh, hundred years of Ordnance Survey, which is unbelievable, really. And uh, I ended up getting the map for uh, Stoke on Trent, and I thought, well, you know, oh, Stoke on Trent, it was a gift. I thought I'll look at Wedgwood. I'll start looking at Wedgwood, and it generated, and that just shows you from one thing, it generated a plethora of work. You know, for me, I was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, let's do the ghost. Let's take that one because that's now I'm itching. I want to see that. I want to get that on camera. This, this is the business now. This is the business end. This is where it gets exciting. I mean, that is waiting to happen. And I, experience tells me that I will get something from this. So it'll be worth it. So, but the lovely thing about printmaking, which I, I've never lost it, and I've talked to friends who are ceramicists, and it's exactly the same thing, and I've done ceramics as well. One of the things about print is you never know what you're going to get. You never that it's, oh, it's the joy when you pull the blanket up. 
and it's just it's infectious when i teach classes uh you can see people's faces they're just a they can't believe it's so simple and b they're just like oh my god this is amazing and you can see the creative cogs going thinking god i could do this i could do that and that's what i love about it and like a ceramicist putting work into a kiln some of the best best things happen through the accident and then if you're any good if you're a Grayson Perry or whoever you are you then seize the happy accident and you say right how did that happen why did that happen how can I reproduce it because that's about having control it's all well and good having the happy accident the chance thing Francis Bacon talks about the chance mark and I'm a great believer of that when I paint because I paint with my hands I paint with my fingers when I'm painting um, but actually it's learning to run with it and control it because once you've done that you've cracked it so that's that's it now so you can see the paper is damp it's what we call annealed so it takes me back to my engineering days this annealing we used to do pipe pipe bending and we used to have to anneal copper to pipe bend so done all sorts in the past I've done welding metal spraying all sorts worked in heavy engineering i come from a very sort of working class background so socio-economic background it was classed in them days as um, effete for men to go and do art and the art teacher actually came to the house when, when you know i had a place allotted ready for art school so it's what i should have done originally and uh, the background i come from dictated you went and got a trade this has all gone uh, what we're actually looking at here is uh, the sheds these are the main hangars at the back of the building where we did the big tanks and stuff uh, and i was in a machine shop over there on the other side now this i lived on this this is my lathe this is a dean smith and grace center lathe and i was classed as a center lathe turner so it's a big boys lathe this you've got um, quite a substantial piece of kit probably the rolls royce of lathes as well these are all the oil feeds uh, everything has to be oiled um, obviously you're machining and to to maintain integrity of of of, of uh, tolerances and and tightness everything has to be clamped and everything has to be absolutely no movement whatsoever precision made machinery uh, to do a precision job basically so i'd be working this lathe machining bearing cases uh, was one of the main jobs so how long did you work on that i stood on that lathe for about nine years a long time breathing in cast iron dust and you know yeah it was uh, every night I'd go home and have a shower because I, I used to go on like a miner, black bright, all the carbon. Uh, yeah, but it was precision work. Yeah, uh, it is a brutal environment. Uh, a very, very heavy, noisy, dusty environment. Uh, probably one of the links probably to uh, the lung disease I've got now, sadly, which I've been battling for 16 years. Um, however, that's, you know, I'm, I'm stable and I just get on with it. But yeah, no, I, the, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm glad I don't work in that environment anymore. Um, I miss some of the lads, yeah, the banter, the crack, but not really. It, it, the very different world and a very different time. Um, there's a famous film and it was like a, a lot of the kitchen sink films made in the 1960s. Um, an absolute classic film, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And that's exactly what Adam's Hydraulics was like. It was like Saturday night, Sunday morning, or even like I'm All Right, Jack. Bolton Brothers film that's another classic I mean they show you him in, in the machine shop with a fly press I used to work on them fly presses so that's another classic film one of my favorite films that with Peter Sellers but yeah no no I don't I don't miss it no, I certainly don't miss it no 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 not a good environment to be in at all the thing that puts people off with printmaking is all the paraphernalia now you're in my studio this morning and as you can see we've got an etching press we've got a washout tray We've got a roll-out table, roll-out glass top tables, all the inks, all specialised equipment. And then, you know, I can go from this to etching. So etching's an intaglio process. And etching is a form of uh, biting the plate, intaglio, and you corrode the plate and create what we call a groove, which is the intaglio, and that holds the ink. Having said that, there's also another technique called dry point, where you can get a piece of polypropylene, a piece of plastic, and you can scrape into it with a needle and whip a burr up. You can also do it on aluminium as well. And that creates an intaglio. But in that one, it's the burr that holds the ink. So you get a beautiful fibrous mark 
in, in a, a, a dry point. Beautiful fibrous mat. But then equally, you've got these up here. That, that particular piece there is a collagraph. Now that's a sandpaper print. Um, so that's done using plywood, a piece of marine ply, aero ply, and some sandpaper stencils cut out. And they make a fantastic mezzotint, which is about tone. So it goes on and on and on. And I was very fortunate I got the uh, scholarship to train in, U in Utrecht in Holland. So I became a specialist printmaker. What's the one type of printing that you specialise in? Oh, monoprinting, definitely. And the monoprint is the unique print, the one-off. It's uh, not to be confused. I mean, people think, oh, mono, monochromatic and things like that, like tone of one colour. No, no, no. A monoprint is a unique piece. I look at them and I treat them as my paintings. They're just the same as my paintings. They're no different whatsoever. Um, so that's where I'm coming from when I'm monoprinting. You can do lots of things in monoprint that you can't really do in painting. It's a different, it's a different uh, orthodoxy, really. You know, you're taking inks, you're working in this case with oil-based inks, um, and you can work in layers, so you build up in layers. So you, you've got this stuff here, which is a, a transparent medium. Uh, this allows us to stretch the ink out. It keeps the intensity of the ink, but it allows it to be transparent. So like, think about it like stained glass. It's a bit like stained glass. You're looking through and you're layering. That's, that's what that does. But then equally, to emulsify the ink, make the ink work for you, we use a gel medium. So that's a linseed reducing gel. Um, and that makes the ink roll out and, and work well on the rollers. So sometimes if it's really hot in here, you don't need as much as that because it's already got a good viscosity. It'll already move around. Um, and you learn over the years as you get to work with inks, you, 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 there's a thing called flattening the ink layer. So for instance, we put the ink out, we roll it out. This is a brayer. We call it a roller, but it's actually parlance says it's a brayer. And you always, when you're rolling out, you're flattening the ink layer. You're creating a platen of ink. Once you get the, the correct thickness, um, you can, you know, you're ready to sort of use it. But the trick with this is different viscosities. Now, this is, if you look at the pixel count, the way the, way the light is hitting the top of the ink, you can tell that that's quite a thick, what we call a thick ink, because it's, it, it's sound. You listen to your roller. When I'm teaching, I, I often say to students, it talks to you and goes, it's saying, use me me you know but you can tell by the sound of it you can't I can't emphasize enough it's 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 difficult enough to get these effects um, but you need to really know what you're doing with the ink that's the skill of it usually this picks it up now you're getting a bit of offset there as well which is quite nice uh, unpredicted you know you just don't know and so the what's happening here now is I'm directly printing directly rolling my ink out which is a lovely viscosity and I quite like that bit of light coming through there because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to peel them off but before I do that I get a bit of this lovely gum con as well You ain't got to be precious with it. If you're precious, you've had it. You can't be precious with it. You mustn't be precious. You've just got to do it. You can't, uh, as I say, you can't really uh, can't really hurt anything. I mean, you know, if, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to tear it up. That's the worst. I mean, it seems strange because most people will think of prints. I mean, they think of like newspapers or something. Oh, ah, well, that's the problem. Yeah, that, that, the biggest problem you've got is educating the general public without sounding pretentious is if you say print, they also think of Athena or, or Ikea. Or, and these things are mass produced in their thousands. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. They're, they're price sensitive, you know, they're, they're accessible on a certain price and all that. And we all know about that. You can go anywhere and buy printed ephemera that's stretched on canvases. Now it's all digital. Um, but it's not unique. It's not artisan. It's not a one-off. Um, and that's the difference. Or a limited edition print. And when I say limited, and I don't mean 3,000, I mean maybe 20 or 28, and maximum say 100, maximum say 250, which is still a very small edition. Uh, and that's what you'll find most printmakers won't, won't edition more than 50. Um, so it, it becomes an object of, you know. And there are print, people who are informed about print, they're aficionados, you know, that collect, collect prints. It's an accessible way into the art world, you know. I've got collectors who buy a print from me 
um, maybe aspiring eventually to buy a painting, you know, and that's great, you know. So it's a, it's a nice thing within the marketplace as well, commercially. Very, very, very good thing to do. Yucky nut. Yeah, so I'm going to mix that with that. Oh, lovely, look at that. Oh, 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 great. Oh, that's, that's superb, isn't that? Do the drop test, see what it's like. Yeah, lovely, that's it. So that's just, I just know, but I feel. I don't know how I know, but I know. Oh, that needs taken down. The pallet knives as well, they're very special. They're not chef's knives, they're not uh, they're not knives that you use in the kitchen. These are bespoke pallet knives, which they have a strong a strong resistance. They don't have a, a, a lenient bend. They're, they're very particular for working with inks. So you can really manipulate. There we go. It's probably no, no accident really, I suppose, that when I did my Billy Elliot thing in my late 20s, I ended up doing a foundation course and uh, I discovered the print room. And as soon as I discovered that, that was it. That was, the, that was my future, preordained. Printmaking's been very good to me. Uh, but I'm quite, you know, I love, I love messing about. So the reason I'm waggling the paper is freeing up the fibres. Um, you don't just pull it straight off because if you do that you can tear the paper. It's very fragile. I mean it's going through massive, massive pressure. Now that's still got one stencil on it so I'm going to just remove that stencil. And that gives you some idea of the capillary strength of the press. It's really forced every part of that. Oh look at that. <laughs> you see I could work on top of that as well. I could do all sorts with that. It just never ends. You know I could build on top but it's picked up that lovely sgraffito coming through which is a lovely clean graphic line within that image. But then like I said if you remember let these little bits talk to you because you know, if we look at painting and if we look at contemporary artwork, it's all about the edge. It's all about what's going I go from this to complete abstraction. So, like, I'm very influenced by Sergei Polakoff and the Russian Constructivist School. But I can equally look at Kazimir Malevich. I can, I can look at Keith Vaughan, brilliant paints for the 1950s. And it all, I don't know, it's all going on in my head. You know, I've got St. Ives going mad in my head. It's great. But that, I mean, I think that, just for... Just for this morning, just is like, I mean, that's just got everything. It's just lovely. So that'll end up in, in a mount probably. But it could maybe do with just a bit of local colour. So I might do a little stencil for that later on and print on top. I don't know. We'll wait and see. But that's just the start, you know, and that's the ghost. So if we look at that and we look at that, you can see the difference. That's the print. There's more air in it. There's more, there's more joyous movement in it. Uh, simple, very simple, but it's knowing that I could get that from that. You know, that'll end up as a collage, or I'll end up working on top of it, and maybe even obliterate it. But, you know, it, it's playing. I mean, obviously, I've got these things going on, which which are not that successful, really. They're, you know, they, these really are what they are. So they'll end up as collage, which is great, you know. And this is to show that I'm not precious, you know, because people go oh my god but you see now look at that now i've just torn that for the camera shall we say but look at that that's gorgeous that's going on a piece of collage that's uh, do something with that gorgeous so and once again as soon as you start tearing elements you oh, <laughs> there's an element there a graphic element all done completely not thinking now because that's taken out the context of being a vase or a pot it's now an abstracted form running with these abstract shapes. It makes more sense as a piece of work. That can be collaged, that can be built up, that can be worked on. Nothing goes to waste in my studio. But it doesn't mean you make a silk scarf out of the sounds here, because that's, that's another question entirely. So these are all to be, these are what they are, you know. But uh, I just like the sound of tearing. I think that's what it is, destructive. Destructive quality in me. Anyway, I'm pleased with these. So I've got I've got two there that are absolute winners, I think. I know one thing. I've earned my pint of Sam's tonight. I think I might have to be down the castle and have a pint. Right. 
very spoilt in this village. We've got two pubs, which is lethal for me because I only live at the back of one. So. Yeah, I mean that's a cracking question. That you, you don't. I mean, one of the problems with the uh, with all work. I mean, I think this applies to painting as well. It's not just not just printmaking. It. Um, I have a little. I have a rule of thumb, really. You know, if they talk to you because it's an organic process. You can't. It's not prescribed. There's no beginning, middle, and end. There's something linear and you just, you exit at a certain point and then you're glad you have and it's only the next day when you look at what you've been doing that you can make that editorial decision and it's editing. That's the crucial thing to my output, editing. I produce a lot and I edit to get to the good stuff. That's maybe how I work. Not all artists, some artists work on one thing at one time. I can't, I just can't be, I can't be bothered with that. I just, it's not the way I am, uh, guy, you know, I don't work like that. About. It's quite a laborious process, but I work quite quickly. Um, slowing down a bit for, for the camera, I suppose. But it's, uh... I was known for a long while solely as a printmaker, but there's always been the painter in me. In printmaking, you go down certain routes, and that has its very own particular language. And painting is, is, is I won't say it's better, and I won't say it's bigger, it's different. Again, so I bring all the various languages that, that I'm familiar with, that I'm interested in, and I bring it into my painting. I paint like a printmaker, I printmake like a painter. I think I do, I need to do more with it. So I can't stop. So I think we just carry on. So I'm gonna carry on. <laughs> 